Oh, hey! <laughs> Man, I kind of like the spotlight up here. If that doesn't encourage you guys to sign up for the men's retreat, I don't know what will. Steve Strandberg will be back there uh, with sign-up sheets. If you guys want to join the 2024 men's retreat, I want to encourage you guys to sign up today. Um, if you can't afford the whole thing, you can always make payments. We're still, uh, we're still like uh, almost three months out, so there's plenty of time for you guys to uh, raise up the funds, sign up, come to the men's retreat. If you don't have a ride up there, we'll find a ride for you. So there's no excuse not to sign up. And uh, with that, I want to invite uh, Elder Jeff up with his new hairdo. And uh, yeah. can I, I pray? I know. I look terrible. <laughs> I do, man. <laughs> Not being grounded was a painful lesson. It was. It yeah. was. Yeah. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity for this shameful plug. But uh, honestly, guys, if you haven't signed up for the retreat, I really encourage you to. You will be blessed. Your families will be blessed. But most importantly, God will be glorified. Amen. Can I pray for you? Yeah. Toss that thing. Don't forget, we're returning. <laughs> Father, we just come before you this evening, Lord, as we lift up the message to you. God, I lift up each and every heart in this room individually, Lord, that, uh, Lord, you would encourage us, convict us, and uh, help us to act like real men in uh, everything that we do, Lord. Especially uh, here tonight, we're going to be talking about our work life and uh, our obedience to the authorities above us, Lord. Uh, and uh, we know that our main authority, Lord, is God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so help us to be obedient in, in every way, Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, gentlemen. How's everybody tonight? All right. Give me a second here while I get everything turned on. All right, well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, hope you enjoyed reading our chapters and everybody read them before we got here. I see a whole lot of yeses, a few noes, a thumbs up. Good job, Frank. <laughs> All right, well, why don't we go ahead and pray? Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, God, I just, I praise you so much, Lord, for these, these opportunity tonight for us and these men to gather together, Lord, as we, as we dig into your word. Lord, I pray that you would bless our time, bless the time in the groups, Lord, and I just, uh, I pray that you would just give them courage and strength, Lord, as they share and they and they answer questions, Lord, that they would answer from their heart, Lord, that they would be honest and that they would seek to, to draw, draw closer to you, Lord, and to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so tonight is, uh, it's our fourth, our fourth lesson, and we're going over the chapters seven and eight. Right, they are real men. Work with diligence, and uh, real men respect authority. Right, so as we go through this man code, we know that everyone needs to have a code. Right, we're men, so we have a man code. But why do we need a code? Well, it determines, right, just values that we want to work towards, that we strive for, that we want to live by. It's not something that we're necessarily going to achieve all the time. Uh, I know that there's times I would say, yes, I absolutely worked with diligence, and I can guarantee you there's times I did not even come close to it. But it's, uh, it's something that we want to live by, that we want to strive for, right? We need a set of principles. We need priorities in our lives. But why these 12, right? Got them up here on the screen. Why these 12? So if you remember back in week one, Pastor John talked about pursuing biblical success. And he said it was kind of this overarching umbrella of the study, right? All right, so we've got biblical success. We've got focused ambition, assumes responsibility, exhibits godly character, demonstrates consideration, and on down. You can read them all. I'm not going to read them all out. But why these 12? Well, it starts here. It starts with biblical success, number one. 
And it starts right here in the Bible. But why? Why do we start in the Bible? Why don't we go on to Google, right? Type up codes to live by. Um, the answer is really fairly simple, right? Because we were created by God. If we need a code to live by, go code to live by, then we go to Him who created us, right? He knows how we're supposed to live as men, so He's who we seek our answers from. All right. So the man code: How men who follow Jesus live. And you've all seen this slide here as well most weeks. It's the theme of our study. Be watchful, stand firm in faith, and act like men. And how do real men act when they're working? Right? Well, real men work with diligence. Does everybody know what diligence means? Fantastic. I don't, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> right? Diligence is constant and earnest effort to accomplish what is undertaken, persistent exertion of body or mind, right? Diligent work isn't just manual labor, although it can be. You can sit behind a desk and work diligently. You can drive a truck for a living and you can work diligently. You could be a painter and you can work diligently, right? It's, it doesn't have a specific job that requires you to work diligently. It's a specific mindset. Okay, diligence implies intentional action. Diligence or steady perseverance is one's effort results in careful, energetic, and persistent work. Diligent people get the job done. They don't quit until they've given it their all. And the Bible uses the word diligence in several ways, and it is always in a positive sense. We find it a number of times in the book of Proverbs. Well, we find it a number of times throughout the Bible, but I'm going to use a couple of verses in Proverbs. All right, we start with uh, Proverbs 10, 4. Oh, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Also, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the di diligent is richly supplied. So working hard is a mindset, and so is laziness for that matter. But it's easy to see the contrast in the, in the two lines in these, right? One of it goes over laziness, right, and uh, the negativity of that, right? The sluggard, he's going to crave things. He's not going to get anything. And then on the other side, the positive side, the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Oops. But uh, those who uh, work diligently have success. And I use these two Proverbs just to show a couple of the ways that we can diligently work hard. It's not always just working. It's studying, right? We need to work hard in our walk with Jesus. We need to study the Bible to know God. And we need to do it diligently. Right? We need to work diligently in everything we do. So the sluggard might desire uh, but he's not going to get what he desires because he's lazy, right? He's not going to get anything from sitting on the couch, eating bonbons, watching reruns of NCIS, right? It's going to take diligence. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take study for him to get maturity, right? It's going to take diligence in prayer. It's going to take diligence in practice. While I was preparing for the study tonight, I came across this quote that I quite liked. Uh, and it's from a guy named Arthur Brisbane. He was a newspaper man, whatever that means these days. Um, it says, the dictionary is the only place where success comes before work. Right? And those words... <laughs> the, <laughs> Those words capture a principle that is found throughout the Old and New Testament, right? And it's actually going to be our takeaway tonight. Diligent work is a worthy and necessary pursuit if we are to accomplish all that God asks of us. So let's look at God and work. If we're going to look to God to see how we're supposed to work, 
Let's find out what God thinks about work, right? In this chapter, uh, Pastor Mark points out that even before the fall, God had given humans work to do. So it says here, when Adam and Eve sinned, a curse fell on humanity. Theologians call it the fall. Some people believe work is part of that curse, but it is not. Even before the fall, God commissioned humans to do specific things. In Genesis 1.28, he tells them to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And that is work. And everything on this list is work. I recently in my life learned out how much work it is to multiply. Right? Raising kids is a lot of work. And I'm not even talking about raising them right. I'm just talking about making sure they don't die. <laughs> you have to feed them every day, like multiple times a day. Right? And then after they eat, they fill their diaper. You got to change their diaper even more times a day. Right? You got to bathe them. You got to clean them. You got to make sure they don't do stupid things where they break their neck. You got to make sure your father-in-law doesn't fall over holding one. Uh, uh, but it's work. It's work. And we're supposed to do it diligently, right? Um, let's also look at Exodus, chapter 20, verses 9 and 10. Let's see what God thinks about work here. He commands us to labor, to work six days, and on the seventh day you rest, right? Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God, and on it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, All right? So do you think God expects us to work? It says it right here. We're supposed to work for six days. Now, in our country and our culture, the norm is to work five days a week, eight to five, eight to four, something like that. But how many people actually go home after their fifth day of work and don't do any work? I don't know anybody here, just because I'm going to say we're all real men that go home and then just sit on the couch for two whole days and don't do anything, right? Okay, Pastor Thomas pointed at somebody. All right. <laughs> right, we all have to go home and do work, whether it's mow the lawn, right, water the garden, feed the pigs, pick up after your dogs, do the honeydew list, change a diaper, right? There's always work to do, and we're supposed to do it diligently. Right, We need to work diligent in every aspect of our life, even the mundane things, even the chores, and we're supposed to do it all to glorify God. Um, here's another example of how God feels about work. Leviticus 23, 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Now, that doesn't say anything about work. But uh, if you remember, Pastor Thomas used that verse a couple weeks ago. Uh, and he went to the book of Ruth, and he talked about Boaz, and he used it as an example for assuming responsibility. But tonight we're going to look at it as an example of how God views work. Right? He commands them to leave the edges of the fields and the gleanings. What he doesn't do is he doesn't tell them to go back and harvest it for the poor. He doesn't say, all right, well, go ahead and bake them bread and then give it to the poor. He says, leave it to the poor because he expects the poor to go in and work for it. Right? We'll use Ruth as well. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 it says, now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. 
And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. So Ruth didn't go to this field, get in a line, open up a bag, and just have food dumped into it. No, Ruth went, and she worked, and she worked hard. I would never looked up what gleaning is, but it sounds hot, sweaty, and dirty. and I don't want to do it. But she did. She worked for her food. And now the Bible is filled with lots and lots and lots of examples of men that work with diligence. We have Joseph. Right? Do Joseph's diligence is evident throughout his life. From his faithful servant as a slave in Potiphar's house to his leadership in Egypt. And despite facing numerous trials and injustices, Joseph remained steadfast in his commitment to God and his responsibilities. And as he declared to his brothers who had once betrayed him, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Joseph's unwavering diligence ultimately led to his elevation to a position of authority where he played a pivotal role in saving Egypt and his own family from famine. We've also got Daniel. Right? Daniel's diligence was also exemplified in his just unwavering commitment to prayer and obedience to God. Uh, even in the face of persecution, right? despite being thrown into the lion's den for his faithfulness, Daniel remained steadfast, trusting in God's protection, giving thanks to God just as he'd done before. Uh, Daniel's diligence not only preserved his own life, but also brought glory, glory to God in adversity. So we could talk about many others. We could talk about Paul, Timothy, Moses, we could talk about Job, talk about Noah. I mean, Noah. How long did Noah take to build that ark? Right? I mean, the Bible doesn't explicitly say, but we know it's a long time. And forget the fact that he was like 500 years old when he started. <laughs> but he worked for like 100 years. I get bored after a day. But he worked with diligence, right? And he glorified God, right? How about Nehemiah? Nehemiah, there's, Nehemiah is another great example. And you remember John talked about him back in week one as well. And he used him as an example for focused ambition, which is just one of the great things that I've enjoyed about this study. Is as you read this book, as you read the man code, and you look to the Bible for examples, you find men that lived it, right? I'm talking... I'm talking about working diligently and respecting authority. And you can take John's message and put these chapters in place, and it would com make complete sense. You could take Thomas's message from a couple weeks back and do the same thing, and it would make sense. Because the great men of the Bible, they lived the man code. Right? They had biblical success. right? And biblical success is, again, it's that overarching umbrella for the book. We do chapters 2 through 12 to accomplish chapter one. So as John pointed out in, uh, in week one, Nehemiah absolutely had and he needed focused ambition, but that wasn't enough. He also needed to work diligently. He needed to work diligently in every aspect of his life to uh, accomplish his goal. And at the start of the book of Nehemiah, he finds out that the walls of Jerusalem are still broken down, the gates are burned down, the people that have returned have failed to rebuild. They're ashamed. People are mocking them. People are mocking God. And what did Nehemiah do? When he found out, he prayed diligently. Think back to the definition of diligent, right? Nehemiah prayed with earnest effort to accomplish something. He prayed with intent. Right. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying for the God of heaven. So we fast forward a month, and Nehemiah is there before the king, right? he's given him his wine, and it just so happens the king asks him what he wants, right? and he was prepared. He had worked and studied diligently in that month to have an answer. Should the king have come to him and find out what was bothering him, to offer him assistance, he was ready. Like, he had to figure out 
which route to take. He had to figure out who he was going to get wood from. He had to get letters for governors. He had to figure out how many people to take. It's just a massive, massive thing that he's not going to figure out in the five seconds he had after the king asked him, what do you want? But he had worked and he'd studied diligently on the off chance that he should have that opportunity to go before the king and tell him what he desired. And after he gets to Jerusalem, he's there for three days, and then he rides out at night. He surveys the walls. He surveys the gates. He's making sure he knows everything that needs to be done, right? And then he sets about rebuilding the walls, and he does it diligently. He's not sidetracked or derailed. He's not sidetracked or derailed when they try to kill him. He's not sidetracked or derailed when they mock him. He's not sidetracked or derailed when they try to trick him into sinning. Right? His diligence is evident in his unwavering determination to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Despite facing opposition and challenges, with careful planning and unwavering faith in God, Nehemiah led the people to completing the task in just 52 days. And his resolute declaration amidst opposition of, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down, underscores his unwavering commitment to God's mission and his diligent efforts to see it through to completion. So if we men are living in a way that shows that we follow Jesus, then we are working diligently for Jesus in all that we do, in all aspects of our lives, not just our nine-to-five jobs. All right. I want to make a reference here to a couple passages. First one's going to be in Ephesians, and the second one's in Colossians, and they're, they're similar. First one says, oh, got that right. All right. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. In the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good things each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And in Colossians, uh, slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with ex external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. All right, so do your work as if you're working for the Lord. Even if you're a slave, you do your work according to what your master calls you to do. You do it sincerely. You do it with fear and trembling, realizing that you have a master in heaven right, who has authority over you. But you do it as if you are doing it for the Lord, because in reality, it is his work that you are doing. He is your true master. So these verses, they show not only uh, that we are to work hard, but also that we're going to be working under authority. The authority of God and sometimes the authority of men. So if you want to pursue biblical success, then you need to work diligently. A lot of the times that also means you're working under someone else's authority, which brings us to our next part, and that is... Respecting authority. And it is very difficult to respect authority if you don't understand what authority is. At the very end of the book of Matthew, chapter 28, I think it was verse 18, Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And way earlier in the book, we've got chapter 8. There was a centurion who already knew that. So Matthew 8, chapter 5 and 10, and it says, And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be here. For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. 
And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Now, because a centurion was someone who lived under authority and had those under him, under his authority, he understood what authority meant. He understood the authority Jesus had, that he didn't have to go to his house to heal the man. He could just speak the words and it would be done. And surprisingly enough, this Bible also has a lot of things to say on authority. It begins with God's authority over us, and it continues on with God delegating authority. He delegates authority in our marriage. Right? The Bible is very clear that male and female have true equality and worth before God because both are made in his image. Right? Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Yet in the functioning of the home, there's a chain of command. Right? The husband is accountable to God. The wife is submissive to her husband. And the children are to be obedient to their parents. Paul clearly describes the proper husband and wife relationship in Ephesians 5.23, where he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. So God delegates authority in the home, in the church, and in the workplace. Ephesians 6.5, again, A bondservants obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. You've got Romans 13, 1 to 4. God also delegates authority in government. Right? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Now, we've all known and dealt with government officials and laws, ordinances that we don't like. Right? We've probably all been pulled over. Right? Nobody wants to get a ticket for speeding, right? especially when we're going one mile over the speed limit. Uh, nobody wants to have to go get a permit to build a shed in their backyard. Or if we're doing it right, to just put in a new outlet. Right? But so we've all had officials over us. We've all had authority over us. All right, but if we remember what we just read, there's no authority except God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So we respect them. Right? If we go to Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17, right, we're going to see the Pharisees try to trap Jesus with a question about human authority. It says, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. They came and said to him, teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one. For you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. So they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now the lesson we learn from here is very, very simple. right? We follow the laws of the government as long as they don't contradict the laws of God. Now, one of my favorite examples in the Bible of someone respecting a bad leader, a bad king, is David and Saul. And it's also a great illustration of God justly giving people the leader they deserve. Now, here's just a quick brief intro into how Saul became a king. We'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 8, 
starting at verse 4. And it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also are doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Right, Israel was a theocratic kingdom in which God was their king. The request for a human king was born out of a heart of disobedience, right? A heart of independence in which his people, they didn't want him as their ruler. Rather, they wanted a king so they could be like the other nations. The request was ultimately just a rejection of God. So Samuel then, he goes on, as he was told, to tell them how Saul is going to be a bad king for them, which basically he's just going to take everything of yours for himself. And you will cry out, but in that day, the Lord won't hear you. Now, throughout his life, Saul proved to be a terrible king. He repeatedly rejected God's will, and he went his own way. Saul turning away from the Lord was marked by numerous foolish acts that spread out throughout his life. Uh, Saul was a man whose flaws were evident because he thought he knew better than everybody else, including God. Saul was a bad king because he didn't respect God's authority. So why was David so loyal to Saul, even though he knew he was a bad king, even though he knew he didn't respect God's authority? Because David did. Because unlike Saul, David respected God's authority. The primary reason David was so loyal to Saul was the anointing King Saul had received from the Lord. In other words, the Lord was the one who chose Saul to be king, and David refused to go against God's will. On one occasion, David had the opportunity to kill Saul, and he refrained from it, saying, As surely as the Lord lives, the Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come, and he will die, or he will go to battle, and he will perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. David believed Saul was in God's hand, and he was forbidden to put Saul to death himself. David had great faith in God's plan and timing. Now, as long as God wanted Saul to be king, David would wait. He would not take matters into his own hands. So just as we need to work diligently in all aspects of our lives, we also need to respect authority in all aspects as well. We need to respect authority in our study. We need to respect authority in our practice. We also need to respect it in our prayers. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Paul says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we respect the government in our prayers for the same reason that we respect them in our actions. First off, because God tells us to. And secondly, because respecting them in our prayers is a form of respecting God, who is our ultimate authority. Right? Again, we all have someone in authority over us. And that can change at different times throughout the day. You could be at work and have your boss over, over you. You could be driving home and the sheriff that pulled you over, his name is Jose, now he's an authority over you. Right? Um, you could be a kid young man who it seems like everybody is an authority over their parents grandparents aunts and uncles teachers right you could just be an old man who has loads of money you don't go around anybody you got no family but god's still over you in authority
and anything in between, right? If you're going to be successful in life, you need to have biblical success. In order to have biblical success, you need to do these 12 things. You need to live up to the code. You need to work diligently, and you need to respect authority. Thank you.